as you know, we've been uh, sort of bouncing back and forth between uh, two different series that I want to preach. So I hope that's okay. I hope your uh, brains can multitask. Can, can anyone here multitask okay? I don't know. I don't think anyone in our society knows how to do that, but I know you can do that, right? But on the one hand, I want to go through a series of topics that we're calling the DNA of CLJ. What are our core values? What makes us distinctive as a church? And we started out by talking about a radical kingdom mentality. And Pastor Roberto, without knowing I had just talked about that, preached about that last week, if you didn't notice, about selling all and trusting the Lord and giving everything on the altar to Jesus. Now, the other series I want to talk about is issues related to community. What helps us be together as a community? And I think what I'm already discovering is that those two things connect intimately because we connect together over our core values, right? So those go together a lot. So we've been talking about Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13, about what it means to love one another in Christ, what it means to be a true Christian community. And so we're going to continue going with that today. 1 Corinthians 13, and this is not, I'm not going to read the text that I'm actually going to preach on yet. I just want to introduce it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, or starting in the verse just before it where it says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is the most important thing you will ever do in God's kingdom and on this earth. Amen. At the end of it all, when we depart from this life and our soul stands before God in heaven, our life's work will be evaluated by the quality of its love. The Bible talks about how we build on the foundation that is Jesus Christ, but we don't all build the same way. You can build with wood or hay or stubble, whatever stubble is. <laughs> and when fire passes through it, it is consumed. Or when we can build with gold or silver or precious metals, that fire that tests our lives proves that it was valuable and it lasts and it shines more brightly for all eternity. It is love that will be the ultimate standard of how our lives will be evaluated. How well did you love? If there is one thing we get right as individuals and as a church, let it be this. We cannot be effective Christians without effectively loving. The Bible says if you love the Father, you'll love his children as well. If we are real Christians, then we will grow in real love. And so as the kids provide our good background, thunderous music <laughs> upstairs, jumping up and down in praise to the Lord, let's renew that commitment to say, God, this is worth working at. If there's one thing I get right, let it be this. It's worth working in love. If you know that you're going to be tested on a particular book. How many people remember those student days? You still have nightmares about it? Some of you are still students. If you know you are going to be tested on particular material, well, what do you do? You study that material. Well, this is it, folks. Love is really the main topic of study of our lives. So it's worth thinking about and it's worth working at. So let's look at it. First chapter, First Corinthians 13, the rest of the chapter explores the different facets of what it means to love. What does it mean? What does it look like? How do we do this? And so I want to start digging into this. So if you would turn with me again, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. We'll start right there. Okay, you with me? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. It says, love is patient. Why don't we just stop right there? That's all we'll read today. Father, in Jesus' name, we're just going to take this bite today. Yeah. Father, love is patient. 
I pray, God, that you would open up heaven and you would speak to us about what it means to express patient love to one another. God, I pray that you, the shepherd's voice, would communicate this reality to each one of us. Love is patient. In Jesus' name, amen. Easy, right? Easy. No problem. You can all just pack up and go home. We, we all got this down, right? You know, I've had people say this to me. If Christians, if we were real Christians, then love would just come easily, right? If we really knew Jesus and we really had the presence of the Holy Spirit among us, love should just happen, right? It should just be there. It should be fruit, right? Just fruit. It just happens. You shouldn't have to work at it. And I can appreciate that. That where there's authentic Christianity, there should be authentic love. But if it were meant to be easy, then why did Jesus have to pray so hard that we would do it? Amen? If it were so easy to love people, then why did Jesus, and in the rest of the New Testament, did they have to command over and over again that we need to love one another? Why would he need to tell us to do it if it were going to be easy and automatic? Think about it this way, too. Is it easy to love Jesus and love your enemies? Is that easy to do? Think of an enemy. Don't look at him. Just think about it. Easy to love that person? Well, of course, it's your enemy. Of course it's not easy to love your enemy. How about your spouse? Is it easy to love your spouse? Okay, that's anything. No nervous laughter. No looking. Okay, you can look, you can, you can. Now, when you're dating, you know, last night I was preparing this message at a Panera, right? Some of you heard this last night at an event on Zach. I was at a Panera, and sometimes I do a little people watching. And there was a couple, and they weren't a young couple, they were middle-aged, but they were sitting at a table, and they were focused in on each other. They were talking and listening to each other and laughing at each other's jokes. And I knew, they're on a date. They're not it. And then there's other folks, you know, checking their phones, you know, just looking around. <laughs> is it easy to love your spouse? Well, it is at first, right? There's some good hormones that kick in, and you know, that's how God keeps the species going. But then it takes love, it takes commitment, it takes renewal day by day. You know that now. It can be more beautiful, and I believe that marital love becomes more beautiful over the years than it was at first. Because you don't just love the fantasy you had of the person but you love the real person, defects and all, and all their warts and ugliness, and you, you really know them, and you love them anyway. So it becomes even more beautiful when you're all, you know, the way we're getting to be. It grows, so it's a good thing. But it takes work. It takes work. It's not just gonna happen automatically. How about children, right? How about your baby, your little kids? Of course, it is easy to love a cute little kid. They're so cute, thank God. It, helps us survive and change the diapers and deal with the flu and all of that. But how many people know that loving your kids is not automatic or easy all your life, right? That cute little chuckling baby with the cheeks back there eventually becomes a teenager that rolls their eyes at you and knows better than you sometimes. Hopefully not too often, teenagers. <laughs> it's not always easy, it takes work. Love takes work, it takes effort, even though it's something that should be natural. Look with me, Colossians chapter 3, verse uh, 8, we'll say. Colossians 3, 8 says, But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to one another, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put our love, which binds them together in perfect unity. We are already one in Christ, are we not? The Bible says that in Christ, 
there is no Greek or Hebrew. There is no, what else does it say? Circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, city, and slave or free. Look at all the different differences that people can have that are erased. In the body of Christ, it shouldn't be just all people who are exactly like each other, amen? I know I talk about this a lot, but it's in the Bible a lot, and it's important for who we are. Here he's saying that there are Greeks and there's Jews, people with ethnic differences are all thrown into the same congregation. It says that there are people who are slave and free, people with dramatically different socioeconomic situations are all thrown together in the same community. There's Greeks, there's Scythians, whoever they are, are thrown in the mix too. There's people who are different, all mixed together. And God is saying that in Christ, it is only Christ, you are all together, you are one, you're one community, you're one family. We're gonna read later in the book of Ephesians. We are one body, we are organically connected to each other, we're members of one another. If we're separated from the body, we will wither up and die because life flows from the community of Christians. We are one, we have one father, which means we're all brothers and sisters, right? You know, we're all brothers and sisters. What's that phrase? Uh, my brother from a, <laughs> I, don't I don't know. It won't work coming out of my mouth. I just won't fly. <laughs> But we've all got the same father, but just a variety of, like we, one father, we're one family, we're brothers and sisters, right? We, should, we have one faith. We've all been saved by the same blood of Jesus. One baptism, one cup that we're gonna share. We are all one in Christ. So this should all be easy, right? We should all get along. We should all like one another. Amen? It should just be easy. Come on, preach. According to the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians, it says that we need to clothe ourselves with these things, with compassion, kindness. We need to put on love as if it were a garment. Does anyone wake up in the morning fully clothed? No. You don't have to raise your hand because there's some of you that just pass out as you're studying. and Next thing you know, you wake up and you're... But normally, you don't wake up fully clothed, right? You wake up with your pajamas or whatever. So here we've got saying that love, compassion, patience, you're not necessarily going to wake up feeling that way. It's not gonna be automatic. Sometimes you're gonna wake up in the morning and you're not gonna feel like a Christian. You might even forget you're a Christian and you're gonna need to put on Christ like clothing, amen? Sometimes you're not gonna feel very patient. It's not gonna come naturally. We need to clothe ourselves with it. It is a decision that we need to make on a daily basis to adopt these attitudes. So we get up in the morning, you get dressed, and you put on patience, and you put on kindness, and you put on compassion. You can put on Jesus, and you say, I'm ready for action. But it's a decision that we need to make on a daily basis. If we try to let it just happen, guess what? It will not happen. We need to adopt this. And it overcomes the different frictions that we may have. This is something we have to work at. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says the following. Verse 1. He says, as a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen? But going back to verse 3, it says that we have to make every effort to maintain this unity that is already natural and organic. This is going to take work. In Greek, there's a word for it, and I, I love it. I'm going to teach a little Greek today. Spudazdo. Spudazdo. Sounds Italian, doesn't it? Spudazdo. Say it together. Spudazdo. Spudazdo. Means you've got to be diligent. It's the phrase that the Apostle Paul used when he said, 
Be diligent. To do your best to come see me soon. He used the same word when he said, I, I tried as hard as I could to see you out of my intense longing. It's the same word that's used when he says, do your best to present yourself to God as a workman who's approved. This is the word that is used for students who are burning the midnight oil or for the athlete who's getting up at 5 a.m. and working out. This is trying hard and sweating at it, being diligent. It means it's gonna take some effort to learn how to be patient. So let's get to work. What does patience mean? Again, we're gonna to go to the, to the Greek here. The Greek word in the New Testament for patience is makrothume, okay? Macro. Anyone want to take a guess what that means? Big, long. Thume is the word that's used for burning. It's like burning incense or burning hot anger. So literally, makrothumeo means long burn, long fuse. Get it? That's where that comes from. How quickly do you explode? How short or long is your burn, is your fuse? What does it say in the book of James, chapter 1? It says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. Anyone have it memorized? Slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Slow. It means you're slow to say what you're thinking in a certain situation. It means you're slow to hit the horn. It means you're slow to hit reply. Right? You ever hit reply and then like, when are they going to invent software that can retrieve an email I just wrote and sent and want to get back. When are they going to invent that? In the name of Jesus. Is it there? It probably exists. Some of you know how to do it, I guess. I don't know how to do it. So if you're quick to hit the button, I heard of a, I heard of a great illustration they use with children. They take the little kids out at a summer camp. So you go out somewhere where they can get messy. And you go out to the grass and you give them all little bottles of toothpaste. And you say, okay, now you guys squirt the toothpaste out into your hand. And so they all, of course, are having fun. They're squirting all this toothpaste into their hand. They're making a mess. Says, okay, now everybody, first one to put it all back wins. It's not so easy to put that toothpaste back in the tube once it's out. Our words are a lot like that. So if we're quick to speak, well, it's out there. It's said. And it, patience, makrofumeo, is slow to become angry, slow to roll your eyes, slow to, I have a phrase with a dear friend of mine that we use, that when you are tired and you are grumpy and you are miserable and you have an irresistible desire to speak your mind to anyone who will hear it, that's the moment not to speak your mind, <laughs> that's the moment to be patient and to hold back and to breathe and to count to 10. I really believe that much of our impatience comes from stress and anxiety, right? We're in a hurry, gotta get there. I'm in a hurry, it's gotta, get, it's gotta get fixed now. Come on, come on, let's go. That person's in front of you, that person in the line, of course, you know, you know I'm gonna use this illustration, we all know it. You're in the grocery store, you pick the shortest line, it ends up being the person who takes an awfully long time with 15,000 coupons that they're cutting and registering, and, and all the other lines are going right by you, bang, 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 and you're like, I gotta go, I'm in a hurry, I'm gonna be late. Impatient, stress, anxiety, you're in a hurry. Or, you're a perfectionist. It's gotta be perfect, and you're impatient. It's not perfect, it's not right. You gotta be in control. So much of patience is letting go of control. Amen. Breathe. God is in control. <laughs> the psalm we started with today. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the heaven. I will be exalted in the earth. Don't worry. God says, I can do this. I can exalt myself. I can make everything work out. Really, I've been running the universe for quite some time, says the Lord. I, I, I've been doing it. I created it without your help. I, I really, I, I do know how to do this. If you would let me. Patience. Breathe. 
trusting God to take care of what he needs to do. A great medicine, I'm gonna talk about a few different medicines for impatience, some antidotes that we can tell, take. One of them is in the text in James. Be slow to speak, slow to become angry, be quick to listen. Listen. Listening is uh, a forgotten art. You know? Listening, focusing, making eye contact, looking at the person and not just faking it. It's possible to make eye contact and still be thinking about you know, something else. But no, you're really looking. You're not just saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, you choose to enter into what the other person is saying. You choose to be like that dating couple I saw, right? You lose yourself in what they're saying. You care about what they're saying. You, you enter into their story. How many people do this? You're listening to respond to what's being said. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll hold my tongue for a second, but, but, okay. but you're just concocting what you're gonna answer. And as soon as you think of what you're gonna say, you're not hearing whatever else gets said, right? You're just thinking about your response. And so I say, let's just put the response in the shelves and let's listen, let's hear what they're saying. Enter into it. Listen to respect rather than to respond. At the end of the day, maybe you don't even need to say anything. You're just, you just enter into their story. It's a great medicine for impatience, especially with people who maybe take a while to get their thought out, right? That's important. I believe God gives us, people who are in a hurry, sometimes God gives us slow people around us as medicine, amen? Now sometimes, and that's a beautiful thing, really, no, I really mean that. I think God sometimes gives us people in our lives who don't move as fast as we do to work on us. Children will do that for you. It takes an awfully long time to do anything. Oh my gosh, just get dressed, just eat, just go to bed. Why can't we just do it, you know? It, everything takes a while. Not that I'm impatient with that. <laughs> but things take a while to make them happen. I believe that God gives us people with special needs or handicaps. Elderly people sometimes in our lives. Be- gifts from the Lord forcing us to slow down. And there's beauty in that. And there is joy and there's freedom in that. A friend of mine, a good friend of mine who had a, a mental intellectual handicap, she once said, I, I, I'm slower than everyone else I know. And a good friend of hers said something beautiful. She said, no, no, you're not, it's not that you're slower, everyone else is just moving too fast. We're all moving too fast. We need to slow down a bit, especially in this society. So that's medicine. There's another medicine God gives you to work on your patience. A little later in the book of Corinthians, it says, love is not easily irritated. Now that verse presupposes that some people are irritating. It's okay, you can admit it. In fact, all of us are irritating at some time. God gives you annoying people to train your patience. That's okay. People are annoying. We are all annoying in some way. And especially in a multicultural environment. At church, you find some people who annoy you. That's okay. You love people. You know, the whole multi-ethnic thing is very, it's very idealistic. Oh, we're all together, you know, one big happy day. Until you actually really start doing it, you know, and loving people and getting formed relationships and do things together. And people do things differently. And maybe a certain cultural style is different from what you expect. Maybe, like I've, I've talked about this, of when I was new here, about I'm talking to someone and she was right there, right? Remember I told you the story and I took a step back? And you know what she did? You know, step forward. And back, the next thing you know, we're doing this dance to come, I'm against a wall, right? And the person who, who maybe it annoys you that people stand too far away, why are they so cold and unloving? It's just their culture, it's their style to have a little bit more space, maybe. Maybe it annoys you that, in, that some people are so direct, they just say what they're thinking. And it just seems like, wow, that seems so rude. It seems. Or maybe, on the other side, maybe you wonder why people are so too polite. They're so polite, they, take, they beat around the bush. Why don't they just say it? Well, it's a cultural style, right? I know I've talked about this. In, in, in Guatemala, when I was in Guatemala, just trying to order a cup of coffee, it took 10 minutes to do it, you know? It's just, 
but we had to talk about the weather. Si sería tan amable, por favor. It's 10 minutes later, you don't have your coffee. In Puerto Rico, you can just say, you know, dime, tell me, give me coffee. Cream and sugar, now, boom, drink the bottle, boom, we're out of there. There's things that annoy you. A, a person might think, how rude, why don't they talk? Why don't they be courteous and polite? Well, it's cultural style, right? Patience means you give people a chance. It means you're not quick to judge them and say they're rude. No, they're not necessarily rude. Well, maybe they are, but maybe not. Maybe someone is just being the way they are and they don't mean it to be rude. Patience involves a generosity of spirit that says, I'm gonna give this person a chance. I am going to tolerate this person. Now, doesn't that sound bad to say that loving people means putting up with them? That doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? But look, in, in both of the texts I read from Colossians and Galatians, right after the word patience, there's a phrase I wanna read. In Colossians, it says, you clothe yourself with humility, gentleness, and patience. And right after that, it says, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you have against one another. In Ephesians chapter four, verse two, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Putting up with each other. This is the phrase that Jesus used when he found his apostles that couldn't cast the demon out. Remember when he came down from the mountain? And he says, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long must I put up with you? See, even Jesus needed to bear with people. Thank God he does that, right? There are gonna be foibles. There's gonna be annoying things. Things we need to simply tolerate in one another. These are what I would call the shock absorbers of human relationships, okay? Now, I did a little research because I'm not an expert on shock absorbers, but I figured I'm going to look it up. And there's a great website that says how stuff works. So I looked it up, how do shock absorbers work? And what it says, very interesting at the beginning, is that you can have the most amazing engine with all the power in the world, but that is useless if you cannot control the vehicle. And that's why... Having a powerful engine needs an excellent, what they call a suspension system. There's some guys or maybe ladies here who would be like, Greg, you don't know what you're talking about. I confess I don't, but we're just gonna. <laughs> a suspension system. That's the shock absorbers and another system of coils and things that produce two things. It helps you with the ride so that you don't feel the bumps in the road. It also helps you with handling so that the car can swerve around corners without tipping over, and it can accelerate without tipping too far back, and stop without tipping too far forward. The suspension system. Now it said something very interesting. It said, if a road were perfectly flat with no irregularities, suspensions wouldn't be necessary, but roads are far from flat. Can I hear an amen? amen. Anyone driven around Boston these days? There are some fascinating potholes. There was one so deep I thought, Oh my gosh, I don't even have an ending to that. Every bump causes something called vertical acceleration, which basically means the car goes up, okay? So vertical acceleration. Without an intervening structure, all of the wheel's vertical energy is transferred to the frame of the car, which moves in the same direction, up. In such a situation, the wheels can actually lose contact with the road completely, and then under the downward force of gravity, the wheels can slam back into the road surface. So what you need is a system that will absorb the energy of the vertically accelerated wheel, allowing the frame and the body to ride smoothly and undisturbed while the wheels follow the bumps in the road. Got that? Bottom line, without shock absorbers, we're in for a bumpy ride and we could swerve off the road and end up in a ditch. The shock absorbers help things work. Patience is the shock absorber of love. It means you encounter negative energy and you absorb it and put it on the cross in such a way that it doesn't have to bump the church around and the community around and the, or the home around. The shock absorbers. Interesting little detail I discovered here. I don't even know how it relates, but apparently the coils in the shock absorber system can be coiled either tightly or loosely. If they're coiled loosely, 
The car runs more smoothly, kind of that limo ride, like a Buick or whatever. If they're coiled tightly, it's like a sports car. It means you feel the road more, but you can zip around those corners and you can hold the road. I believe, even though our church is on the large side, we are coiled rather tightly as a sports car. We zip around a lot of corners. Things move very quickly in Lion of Judah. There's so much going on so quickly. There's so many different people. We are like a car that is zooming around curves, and we need to be that. But that also means we're coiled tightly. We might feel the bumps in the road. And if we don't cultivate patience, then we just might end up in a ditch. This is important. The shock absorbers of human relationships. Now, some people might say, Greg, some people are naturally patient and nice and friendly, but not me. God just made me like this. Así soy y no puedo cambiar, Gregory. Es mi carácter, right? It's just the way I am. I can't change. I'm just impatient. Well, a good friend of mine used a phrase with me recently that stuck with me. It says, get over it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm not trying to be rude. Okay? You may have a tough character. You might be strong. You might be intense. You might be a go-getter. You might be a survivor. But God was patient with you. He forgave you enough sins to send you to hell. How can you not be merciful with people who owe you tiny little offenses and debts? God was patient with you. There's a verse in 1 Peter that says, God waited patiently while Noah's ark was being built. Noah's ark was not built in a day. How long did it take? Like, like 100 years? How long was it? Who knows the answer? How long? 500 years. Dude, that is a doozy. People lived a long time back then. It's cool. We can talk about that. God waited. He was ready to judge them in you know, the year 1500, and he waited till 2000. Yeah. God waited five, God waited patiently. And you know what? Jesus is coming back, but he's holding off. He's patiently waiting to come back and set up his kingdom, giving people time to repent. It's giving people a second chance. The Bible says that that kind of patience melts us. There's a beautiful verse that says, God bore with great patience the objects of his wrath to make the riches of his glory known. Mercy shown on, on Paul displayed his unlimited patience. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. When God is patient with you, it melts you, and it shows you how much he loves you. Now, as I work towards an ending here, I want to read a parable that Jesus told that demonstrates this element of patience of giving people a second chance, not giving up on people too quickly. And it's a parable that Jesus told. He said, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? How about that? He's seeing something, it's not bearing fruit. Three years, he says, cut it down. But someone else came. Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for just one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Now remember how I mentioned that I've been talking about different elements, core elements of Lion of Judah, the DNA of CLJ? There is one strand in our DNA that you won't find on the front door statement of core values. But in my opinion, it is one of the most core elements of who we are. And it is the concept of mercy. The concept of taking defective, broken, difficult people as we are and giving us time to change and grow and not giving up on them quickly. I believe that is one of the core things that makes us who we are as a church. I'll never forget, in a deacon's meeting maybe 10 years ago, we were talking about bringing on a particular person in a particular leadership role, and everyone in the circle had a reason why this person, no, no, no. And then somebody piped up and said, but wait a minute, how many of us are qualified to be deacons, really? 
And going around the room, everyone realizes none of us really belongs here, do we? We've all been given a second and a third and a fourth chance to become the men and women we are. But we're not like that. We're quick to say, no, off, you know, there's a great phrase, you know, the kings and the queens, off with his head. And it has to be said with a gesture. Off with his head, let's all say that together. Off with his head, I wanna see the gesture. Off with his head. Some of us really enjoy saying that. Off with his head, off with his head. If you were president, you'd have bombed Canada, you know, the minute someone looks at you the wrong way. Off with it. Some people are like, cut it down. But God says, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Let's be patient here. Let's dig around this tree. Let's give it another, let's fertilize it. Let's give it time. There's potential here. Thank God he didn't give up on us. Thank God. And you know, in this church, amen, some of the people that were tolerated when, when sometimes, it, sometimes Pastor Roberto had to stand alone in this. Sometimes he tolerated people that everyone else wanted to kick out. And some of those people are now leaders and blessings in this church. Thank God for the patience of God. I'll, you, you can come on up, but I want to close with um, this story, and then we'll transition to the Lord's table. But um, the Apostle Paul claimed to be patient, right? He was. He was patient because he knew God had been patient with him. But do you know that there was one moment where the Apostle Paul went on a mission with his friend Barnabas? Anyone ever heard of Barnabas? And they went on a mission, and they took a young man with them. He was a teenager, probably. And he was on the mission trip with them. His name was John Mark. And uh, they were doing their mission, but then times got hard. There, were, there was difficulty, there was persecution, there was suffering. And the kid said, you know, I wanna go home. And he went back home to mom. You know, he, he had to go back home to mom's sancocho and arroz con habichuela and, and get pasta and, you know. He had to go home. Now, about a year later, Paul and Barnabas were about to go out on another trip. And this same young man says, hey, can I try again? Guess what the Apostle Paul said? Here. Actually, let's wait a second on the music. Sorry, sorry, thank you. Guess what the Apostle Paul said when, um, when uh, this kid wanted another chance? He thinks, oh, sure, sure, let's give it a try. He's like, no way. You failed us once, you're not coming again. Cut off, off with his head, say, off with his head. And Barnabas, who was known as the son of encouragement, said, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's give the kid a try. Now, he happened to be his uncle, okay, or a cousin, so there was a, a family connection. But he gave him a chance. He said, I'll go, I'll take it. So Paul picked Silas and went in one direction. Barnabas took uh, John Mark and they went in another direction. And you know, it's a good thing that Barnabas gave him a chance. Anyone know who John Mark ended up becoming? You know the gospel of, his middle name was Mark. He ended up becoming the guy who wrote the gospel of Mark. It's a good thing Barnabas gave him a second chance, isn't it? And you know, Paul may have forgotten that when no one else wanted to spend time with him, Barnabas was patient with him. Barnabas took him and listened to him and heard his story and gave him a chance to become Paul. When we take time to be patient with people, we live in true greatness because we unleash the power of God in other people's lives. We let John Mark become Mark. We let Saul become Paul. Patience is part of the measure of our greatness in Christ and a significant one. And so I invite you to stand with me and, and um, let's pray about this. Now I know for some of us we like, my fuse is gonna need some major reorganizing. And God can do that. So I'll invite the ushers, you can go ahead and bring up the, the table. And uh, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and I pray, God, that we as a community would be known for our merciful patience with other people. God, I pray that people who were rejected everywhere else would find a home at Lion of Judah. I pray, God, that we would live out the fact that love is patient. 
I pray, God, that we would see people over the years mature into being beautiful and thriving men and women of God because somebody gave them a second chance. Let that person be us today.